trans people are kind of a big issue at the moment. Not to say there are issues with trans people, it seems they've got it figured out actually, but it's more the issues that people have with them. People like Matt Walsh, Steven Crowder, JK Rowling, Tucker Carlson, just to name the most influential. They all have big problems with trans people. So what are they? The claims often go as follows. Trans people aren't the gender they claim. Trans ideology allows predators to sexually assault people. Trans people are groomers. Kids are being rushed into transition, and trans women in sports have an unfair advantage. There's a lot to talk about there, and we will talk about those points, but there's a quick question that needs to be answered first. Why does this discussion always center around trans women and never anybody else? I think it's time for a quick, poorly researched history lesson. Far before the trans panic, there were women wearing pants all over the place. This is relevant, I promise. By the 90s, it was entirely culturally normalized for women to wear pants in most formal contexts like business and court, and that's a very late estimate. It was mostly normal for women to wear pants since like the 60s, but women's rights movements didn't reward men with the social freedom to wear feminine things like dresses, skirts, or makeup outside of enclosed drag events that remain the subject of right-wing criticism to this day. For a long time, mainstream media has used men and feminine clothing for laughs, using the assumption that men shouldn't wear feminine things like dresses, skirts, or makeup to siphon laughs. Transphobes will commonly exploit the societal characteristic to demean trans women, leveraging the same preconceptions about gender that Bugs Bunny used for comedy but for a more malicious purpose. And no, I don't think Bugs Bunny is problematic in that sense at least. This is an especially effective tactic when the trans woman in question is early in transition, which they usually are when selected by transphobes for discussion. This is done to get already transphobic viewers to perceive all trans people as grown men who think they're women rather than the truth, a group encompassing a much broader set of people where trans women are in the minority. In fact, in the United States, as of May 2022, under the age of 30, there are more non-binary adults than binary trans adults. The reason this doesn't occur in older generations, or other countries, is because, well, the United States is pretty progressive, and old people aren't. Framing the trans debate around specifically trans women only serves to exploit the idea of traditional womanhood in many conservatives. The idea that femininity and womanhood are pure, clean, and holy things that shouldn't be corrupted by masculinity, which is the same driving force behind why women couldn't wear pants until the mid-1900s. Now that you know why people talk about trans women so much, we can finally start to talk about trans women. Talking point number one. Trans people cannot be the gender they claim, i.e. trans women aren't women. This is definitely the biggest, most important talking point of the bunch, and it's the most complicated point to address. So let's break it down. Trans women aren't women. A woman is an adult human female. A female is someone with XX chromosomes and or a female reproductive system. Okay, you may roll your eyes, but let's define sex and gender. Sex is the simpler one. It involves sexual characteristics that include hormones, genitalia, body structure, and a bunch of other little things. All of this is usually decided at birth by chromosomes, but can get really complicated with a lot of factors, including chromosomal disorders. There's Klinefelter syndrome, Turner syndrome, Swyer syndrome, and intersex disorders that all throw a wrench in the idea of a female as someone with XX chromosomes and ovaries. Swyer syndrome, for example, involves a regular female who has XY chromosomes rather than XX the only functional difference being her ovaries don't function properly. You might say, oh, well that would be a male then. XY equals male. But no, you were a fool and always will be. Look at this woman. Look at this woman. What medical or social utility is gained from referring to this female as a male because of her completely irrelevant genetic characteristics? And this woman, this woman has way more similarities to your average woman than your average man. She even, and I didn't know this before researching it, has smaller pores, is more prone to cuts and bruises, and when she touches things may feel different and perceive pain and temperature differently. All this is because she's on the female hormone estrogen. For any medical or scientific reasons, trans women on estrogen should be considered female. Any discussion of chromosomes can be just that. A discussion of chromosomes that's allowed to be more complicated than middle school science class. 
And to clarify, I don't care about precision of language between sex and gender. That's for scientists to care about. Interpersonally, you can just use whatever language makes people feel the most comfortable. Sex is not a binary, by the way. I have been referring to it as one for simplicity, but sex just involves a spectrum of sexual characteristics. Like I said before, someone with a chromosomal disorder is going to sexually differ from the average person. In fact, most people will sexually differ from the average person. Note that when I say sexually, I don't mean sexual attraction. There are loads of minute sexual differences, hence the spectrum of sex. The science on this is settled. You don't need to take my word for it if you don't want to. Nearly all credible researchers and scientists on the topic say sex is a spectrum, but if you disagree, then maybe do some research. Moving on, let's talk about gender. Gender is different than sex. Because everyone credible defines sex as biological and gender as social. Gender is usually defined by a broad set of social characteristics, mainly the spectrum of masculine and feminine traits. That's a definition, but no one will be able to give you a good, socially useful and applicable definition, especially not a transphobe. You've likely heard the question, what is a woman? You've also probably heard the question, what is a chair? That question's impossible, of course. If all physical objects were placed on a huge spectrum of how close they are to being a chair and how far away they are, good luck doing that, by the way, you still have to decide where to draw the line between chair and not chair. This is analogous to gender. You may have noticed my clever use of the word spectrum a second ago, because gender is also a spectrum of traits, just like sex. There isn't any reason to disagree, since we define words based on utility, how useful they are to us. If we were to define a chair through utility, we could say that a chair is whatever most people commonly consider to be a chair. And most people are fine with that definition. We don't need some airtight, mathematically precise definition. But when you talk about gender, it's a different story. Folks need to have an attachment to gender, gender roles, sexuality, gender expression, and gender identity. It really can be as simple as a widespread fear of change. I'm sure a lot of it is sexual insecurity, too. You know the stereotype of the conservative pundit found with imagery of transgender women on their computer. Anyways, let's move on. Talking point number two. Trans ideology allows predators to sexually assault people, mostly in restrooms. A breath of fresh air. A very easy point to debunk. What's that? Oh, looks like a tiny little citation. Let's take a look what it says. Transgender people are over four times more likely than cisgender people to experience violent victimization, including rape, sexual assault, and aggravated or simple assault. Okay, that's not the data that I'm looking for, but... Oh, what's that? Studies suggest that around half of transgender people and bisexual women will experience sexual violence at some point in their lifetimes. Oh, and trans people are way more likely to be sexually assaulted if they're not allowed in their preferred bathrooms. Turns out, most research on the topic involves trans victims and not trans predators, which seems like a non-existent concern to researchers. As far as any study shows, trans women aren't more likely to sexually assault people despite having greater access to women's spaces than cis men. It's actually even more favorable than that. I found a study suggesting that trans teens are less likely to commit sexual assault than their cis counterparts. Another says that trans women are just as likely to commit violent crime as cis men, but according to the author of the study, the individual in the image who is making claims about trans criminality, specifically rape likelihood, is misrepresenting the study's findings. So the evidence is shaky at best in favor of the trans predator narrative. The reason this hypothetical trans predator doesn't exist is because you don't need to be a trans woman, or a woman at all, to go into a women's restroom. You can just go in there as a man. This concern over trans women is only being stirred because of another perceived corruption of femininity, but this time it's about a minority group sexually assaulting white women and bruising their purity. Historically, this has been black men. Calls of degeneracy upon race mixing and, primarily in the United States, the systematic and non-systematic lynching of black people for the accused rape of white women. I'm sure enough of you have read To Kill a Mockingbird to know what I'm talking about. This is pretty much the same thing as that. Because transphobes are, shocker, transphobic. They want to see trans people have fewer rights regardless of any data on the matter, be it scientific or sociological. They just want to hurt trans people. Think about it. If there was a single story of a trans woman sexually assaulting cis woman, it would be all over the place. But it's not, because it doesn't happen. It's a really, really weak argument that they can't even find anecdotes to back it up. 
Talking point number three. Trans people are groomers. Yeah, that's grooming. I guarantee anyone who has ever made this claim has no idea what groomer means. If trans people were considered groomers, then I have bad news for like 70% of right-wing figures. Girls between the ages of like 17 and 24 is when they're technically most fertile. Yeah. Okay? That's biological. That's a fact, all right? I'm just stating facts. That's all I'm doing. So what I'm saying is that the problem is not per se teenage pregnancy. It's unwed pregnancy. That's the problem in society. It's only problematic when, when, when you are not married and you don't have the man there to help you take care of the kids because he's a coward. Talking point number four. Kids are being rushed into transition without proper knowledge of what they're getting into. This one is about as complicated as the previous point. I found one study suggesting that trans people very rarely detransition, and another suggesting that adolescents are almost always prepared for a transition. But the real struggle is finding any opposing evidence at all. I've seen mentions in my research of one study that manages to prove the opposite, but according to every source it has very poor methodology, and I can't even manage to find it. In all of my research, I cannot find a single source that manages to back up this talking point. So I think the question would be, where did it come from other than straight lies? Talking point number five, trans women in sports have an unfair advantage. To start with this talking point, I want to mention that everyone that talks about this does not actually care. If they cared, why don't they talk about trans men in sports? If you think trans people should play with their birth sex category, why don't you talk about trans men on testosterone with huge pulching muscles and testosterone shooting out of their nose playing in cis women's sports? Because they don't care about women's sports. They just want trans people to be sad. But for the sake of argument, let's pretend like they actually care. Let's pretend they actually care a lot about the 0.003% of Olympians that are trans women, which is literally two people. A lot of characteristics commonly associated with cis women are also present in trans women on HRT. Of course, trans women are going to have a higher testosterone level on average than cis women, but let's look at something rather analogous to prove my point. Michael Phelps is a good swimmer. Some would say he's even built for swimming. Perfect for it, actually. But people don't want wingspan to be regulated in swimming, or height to be regulated in basketball. But here's the thing. People get really upset when a trans woman does good in sports, and there's outcries of unfairness. Now people are advocating for testosterone checks that are super invasive for women. Because they don't care about women's sports. That's a very clear double standard for trans people. And I can hear the counter-argument already. Oh, wouldn't people just change their pronouns to play with the easier sports? No! Who would do that? No one's gonna do that. And if you really care about women's sports that much, which you don't, you just care about trans people, then why don't we just separate it based on sex instead of gender? Oh, um, I mean, that would be kind of mean to trans people because, you know, some people are early, whatever, whatever. We could separate it based on hormone distribution instead, or maybe other... What are you doing, little reactionary? Oh, you're just gonna make trans women compete with their birth sex no matter what because you hate trans people, and that's your only motivation. <sighs> Why do I even try? Why bother proposing policies and doing research when transphobes don't care? They just want to hurt trans people. They don't care about solving problems. I can sit here all day and talk about possible solutions to the issue of trans women in sports, but it doesn't matter. Even engaging in this is a waste of time. But reactionaries so often control the conversation, we're stuck talking about something so granular, so atomic in scale, we might as well be talking about how to stop a single serial killer with socioeconomic policies. We need to remember to zoom out occasionally, to look at the bigger picture and look who's being affected by these policies, and not just who's being fear-mongered about in the news. Conclusion. So why don't people want trans people transitioning? The research is clear. Trans people have way higher rates of suicide, and the rates of suicide dramatically go down after transitioning. And transitioning doesn't hurt anyone. So why should we stop them when we define gender and sex? We can change these definitions. Guaranteeing trans people medical treatment and making sure they aren't discriminated against would be way better for everyone. <sighs> 
I shouldn't have to explain any of this, but I'm really trying to work from the ground up here. I don't want to be explaining these obvious, statistically backed realities, but I have to be, because there's so many people that are being misinformed by bad actors and disinformation agents. People like Matt Walsh, Steven Crowder, JK Rowling, and Tucker Carlson, they provide this big narrative of the trans predator, the trans menace, the trans ideology, when that isn't what's happening. It's just trans people. Also, according to my independent research, just as a little closer, trans people, on average, are over 20 times slimier than right-wingers. So I think we can consider the trans debate won as a victory for the transgenders.